covering today is we'll be talking about how to use Git, what is Git, what are different version control approaches and why are we actually using Git or how, why are many, so many people using Git. Uh, and then we'll talk about everything you need to know to uh, successfully complete the first homework, which is in this case HTML, CSS and SVG. And so it will, I will not give you an introduction to how to like properly lay out or build what nice looking websites with HTML. We'll be looking at the structure and at the rules essentially of how a DOM is created, how we can select elements, and then how we can draw elements with SVG. Um, if you want to follow along, this is everything here is interactive. So the first part is in my console, but all of the other parts are interactive on the website. So you can actually, you're encouraged to bring out your computers, to type along, to play out, play around with different examples and so on. Uh, and you can go to this website, databasecourse.net slash tutorials. Uh, this is where you find all the content. Uh, which, where is where you, which is also where you find uh, content for future um, lectures and labs. Um, okay, um, before we start, any organizational questions? Homework one is out, it's due this Friday. Please submit via your 
Canvas drop boxes. Um, everybody is probably aware of the late day policy, so you can submit at the latest Sunday night, but you would lose 20% of your marks. Okay, um, so let's get started. Uh, let's talk about version control with Git. Um, so, why do we want to use version control in the first place? Anybody have any opinions? Yeah. It's much easier with the Git or any other version control like I Okay, but why don't they use something like the history feature in Google Drive or Dropbox? Because here you uh, you have options of kind of creating different branches and let's say there are different teams working on different versions of the code, so we can easily move back and forth between different versions. Exactly. So essentially version control lets us do things like uh, synchronize between a team, keep versions, keep histories, do branches and so on. So we can first keep copies of multiple states of files. We can create alternative states. If you want to like uh, create, like test out a new feature or um, like have a stable branch of a piece of software that I'm developing and I want to implement new features, I don't usually do that in a stable branch, but I would rather have a developer or like a feature branch. Um, it's about collaboration too. It's really, really terrible to do collaborative project without using proper version control. Like the worst case is probably sending code around in emails. The second worst case is probably using Dropbox because you will be writing at the same file at the same time. You will have conflicts. Uh, these will not be moderated in any way. Uh, one thing that is especially important for people who are working on their homeworks or projects is it keeps your work safe. Um, if your computer gets stolen or crashes, if you regularly commit to a version control system that is on the internet, you automatically also have backups. Um, and then finally, um, you can also share what you're doing with the world. You can elicit feedback from other developers. This is like how open source communities work and GitHub has a lot of really cool features um, to support this. So there's two different two major different types of version control. There is the central repository approach, which is kind of like the, the one that I um, used a lot when I was in grad school, uh, where we have things like um, Subversion or uh, CVS. Um, this has like a classic client-server model. So here the green node corresponds to the server, um, and like one server stores the code for everyone, and it stores all the version, and I only give local copies. Um, so everybody needs to write to one server, um, and all operations like history, commit, or branches require a server connection. This is like, as I already mentioned, a traditional model. And one advantage of it is that it's a pretty simple model, right? I have like one um, more complex implementation, which is the server, and then I have clients that communicate with the server. Um, however, it is, gets pretty tricky to manage for larger and for community projects. For example, um, who is allowed to write to the central repository? That's a big problem if you have a bigger team. Or if you're like developing a project in GitHub, you don't want everybody to have write access, right? You want people maybe to have read access and to, to give them the possibility to make suggestions. Uh, that's not, of course, not impossible to implement in, uh, in, in a centralized version control, but it's uncommon. Um, and then how do you apply changes that somebody else your team made? Uh, this is not clear how you would do that properly with central uh, repositories. Um, the distributed version control system is, um, as, we, as the name already says, like a distributed approach. Here, every node has a full history of the repository locally. So, every like if you're using Git, for example, um, you don't have a dedicated server. Every node is conceptually and technically at least equal. In practice, we still often use a server uh, just as a like, convention. Uh, but this is like really just a convention. Your local copy, everybody could pull and push, uh, pull from your computer and push to your computer if that is enabled, uh, equally as for uh, for uh, the GitHub servers, for example. Um, what are the advantages of that? Uh, we don't have any access issues. I can make a local copy, have all of the history here, and I can hack away. Um, I can also like very easily ask. Uh, a partner if they want to accept my changes. So I can point them to my repository, tell them, hey, look at what I've done, and if that is uh, satisfactory uh, for them, they can simply pull from my repository and merge with theirs. Um, the other uh, advantage here is also that uh, everything is local, which means that it's fast, or almost everything is local, and you don't actually need internet connection to um, commit, for example, uh, to work essentially just to do software development. 
Um, and this also emphasizes the commit often model. If you commit to a server, you, like if you have tests running and so on, you might actually break something. Uh, but if you work with your local copy, you can actually commit very often. And so what you should really do is you should uh, commit once per feature. When you're working on something uh, and then you're done and you, before you move on to the next thing, simply commit. This doesn't mean that your friends have to synchronize or anything like that. It just keeps a very clear history of what is going on. What are the disadvantages? Well, it's a more complex principle. It's harder to implement and there's a couple of additional concepts that we have to uh, learn. Specifically, the extra effort to distinguish between committing and pushing and pulling. So, just like a show of hands, who's used Git and GitHub before here? Okay, the majority. This is really changing fast. Two years ago, this was like maybe 50%. Um, so, implementations, I already mentioned some, CVS, SVN, uh, and distributed would be Git or Mercurial, and we'll be using Git in this lecture. Um, so, Git was created by Linus Torvalds in 2005. It's British English slang, roughly equivalent to an unpleasant person. Um, and he essentially he, uh, equates that to him. Like, I'm an egotistical bastard and I name all my project after myself. First Linux, now Git. Um, and so why would we use Git? It's pretty popular. This number here is a little old. I would, I would guess that nowadays it's probably more like 70% of all open source projects uh, use Git. It is very distributed, it's truly distributed, it's very fast, everything is local, it's free, um, it's safe against corruptions, and of course there's also GitHub. So, let's just look at what, how Git in general works. So let's say I start with a local copy, I create a repository, then I, I write something to a file and then I commit something. Okay? So this is like my commit. Then I, uh, I do something else, um, this is like time here, and I commit again. Um, now I want to make a branch. Let's say this is my master. And then I create a develop branch. Okay? Um, and so now once I create this branch, what I do is, is essentially like I make like a copy, create an, or I create a new branch, it's actually more like this. And now these two versions are exactly the same thing. Um, now I can start editing here. Um, so these are two new features that I'm implementing, but then I, I switch back to this other branch and edit something here. Um, and now what happens when I, when I want to synchronize those two, it, I simply, like, um, this in the develop branch, what I would do is I would first catch up with what has, what has happened um, in the master branch. So I would create like a merge node here, like this would take the information from this commit and combine it with this commit, and then I can, if I want to, merge it back into the master. Okay, so now I'm again on the master, and this here kind of like is an implicit node, but it's essentially like um, merged like this. So if I wanted to like now have a server, a server is very much just like another branch. If I have like say a, like a remote here. Conceptually, all I'm doing is I'm pushing this to the remote. And then somebody else could have like another branch. Uh, and this, of course, contains all of the history here. And then somebody else come, could come in and have like a copy of this remote, make their changes, and so on. And this work, work, would work very similarly uh, to what we've seen here. OK. So, um, the rest of this class, uh, or the rest of this part, I will simply be typing. Um, you, many of you probably use some uh, graphic user interface clients for GitHub. I find it more, let's say, explicit to use command line tools, uh, but you're of course welcome to use command line tools. So, um, first you should always configure uh, your repositories. Please make sure that you, and you uh, your Git, please make sure that you properly do that. Um, this is especially important because we care about who is contributing to your project. So we'll be looking at your final project, we'll be looking at your repository, and we want to understand who is writing which part of which of the code. And so to properly set this, please use your proper name and uh, a Utah email address um, if you're um, working on your project. Um, so I've already created the folder here, uh, and now to initialize a Git repository, I simply type git in it. And so now I've initialized an empty Git repository, and what we want to look at is uh, what is going on here in this repository. 
So what we see is uh, that we have like one hidden folder, which is the .git folder. If we look at what is in there, we can see that there is a couple of different files and, and directories. The really interesting part here is actually the config file. So if we do uh, git config, we can actually look at how is this set up, how is this configured. And this is like a very simple, I only have a single branch, I don't have a remote, uh, so this is a very simple configuration file. Here's an example of a little bit more interesting configuration file. Um, here I have a remote origin, which is a GitHub uh, repository, and here I, like, I have the master branch of my local copy. Okay, so when we create a file, Echo simply just outputs something to the console, And then this uh, greater than sign simply writes it to the specified destination. So now I have created a demo.txt file and I can look at what is in this demo.txt file if there's hello little world. So let's add it to version control. That's very simple, git add demo.txt. Okay, let's look at what this does. Git status gives us the status of, uh, of this git repository. It tells us we are on branch master. This is the initial commit, we have a new file. Uh, which is not yet committed, but which is essentially staged for commit. So, um, so we've added this file, but it's not actually a commit. So I could add multiple files uh, and then later commit. So what I'm doing now is I'm committing commit minus m. You can also not use the minus m that only drop into an editor. This is just a commit message. Committing the test file. Okay. So we see that this file is now uh, committed. We are on branch master. There's nothing to commit. The working tree is clean. And our file is around here. OK, so now we change the file again. And by these like double greater than signs, I'm appending something to the file, demo.txt. And now if we look at this, we can see that we have these two lines in here. Uh, if you look at the status of Git, it will tell us, okay, there is a modification happening. Um, so what happens if I commit now? What happens when I run this line? Not working. What's that? Not working. Yeah, it will not do anything. Um, the reason is that you always have to add a file. Uh, like even when you change it, you have to re-add it. So you can do either git add demo.txt or you can do uh, what we had here, git commit minus m and then add a minus a. And these, this simply auto adds all of the changed files. So this is like the command that you would use in a mode, like in a typical scenario um, to um, commit any changes that you make. Like what after happen, happens is that if you use this command, you forget that you have added some files and then your code on the server will break and so on, but and that's another story. Uh, well, wrong order. Okay. So, what we can also do is we can look at what has happened here. Like, this is the, the log of uh, everything that we've done to this repository. So, next, we'll create a branch. Uh, I'll call this branch draft. Okay, now we have, if we hit, hit uh, if we um, type in git branch again, we can see that we have now two different branches. One of them is the master. Um, the other one is the newly created draft branch. And then the star here indicates that this is the branch that I'm currently working on. So if I want to switch the branch, I say git checkout draft. And now I switch to branch draft. And we can see that uh, the demo file is exactly the same as before. Um, and now, um, it's, uh, now let's edit something. So I'm adding a line here. Okay, now I have three lines in this file. I'm committing it. Okay, and now I've, mit I've written those changes to the uh, to the branch. If I again check out the master, 
um, and now look at the demo file, I still only have the two lines. Now let's do something else. I'm adding a line at the beginning and one at the end. Saving this and then committing. Okay, and now uh, the interesting part happens when I want to merge back. What is the problem now if I want to merge back? I've changed the file in two different uh, in two different versions. And so if I um, say git merge draft, I will simply get a message that I have created a conflict. So let's look at that conflict. Uh, what we can see here is that we have this new line here was automatically merged. So this is not a conflict. This was automatically added here. Uh, but here we have in this place, in this like third or after this, are you still spinning? There's two different versions. Um, and so I can either choose the one or the other. In this case, I want to have both. Oops. Uh, and now I have resolved that conflict. Manually, of course. And that is it, basically. Okay, so this is like just raw Git. Any questions about that so far? Great. So if you want to work with GitHub, we now, now let's set up a new repository. <coughs> Calling it demo. And then I'm initializing it with the readme, and then you should also add a git ignore for like, that, that essentially just make sure that like files that your IDE creates or something like that um, simply are not committed. And now I'm creating this repository, and then I can very easily clone that. And so this clone now. Uh, retrieves this repository that was initialized on the GitHub server to my local computer and now I have a demo directory and in here I have the readme but nothing else. Um, okay, so let's write something here again. Um, and Add the file. <coughs> okay, and so at this point I've only uh, I've only committed something to my local repository, but GitHub at this point doesn't know anything about that yet. And so what I have to do is just to synchronize this with the server is run git push. And git push is kind of a shorthand. If you look at our configuration file, uh, we can see We can see that we have uh, this remote origin, and this is kind of the default. If we just run git push, this is where this is pushed to. Um, okay, so what we've done here is we have written this to the to uh, GitHub, and now we can see that this file has appeared here, and we see that it contains Hello World uh, in here. So that is pretty simple. Um, if we want to make a change to that, we can use like, let's, I'm kind of simulating that somebody else is making a change here. I'm editing it directly on GitHub. And now um, this is changed remotely. And what I need to do to get these changes is to run git pull. Okay, now if we look at our local file, we see that there's one line was added to demo.txt. I can look at this and then I see how is it going, which I've just done on GitHub uh, directly. So this is very similar to the merging and branching uh, principle. So um, other GitHub features that I would recommend you use for your project are GitHub issues. Um, it's really good to keep track of what you're doing. You can also um, address these issues uh, directly out of commit messages. So for example, if you're working on a bigger feature or on a, or on a bug fix with multiple commits, 
you can always say working towards number 14. That means you're working on issue number 14, and you can also directly close an issue out of a commit message with like um, fixed number 14, for example, as a commit message, which automatically closes that issue then. And then the other important GitHub principle is forking. So for example, if I um, publish a repository on GitHub, somebody else can fork it. That essentially means they create a local copy. They, can, they have done off their local copy, they have full control, so they can edit whatever they like, they can share it with whoever, whoever they want, and if they at some point later want me to reintegrate their changes, they can submit a pull request, and then I can review their pull request and decide whether I want to accept their changes or not. Um, in terms of graphical user interface clients, there's the official GitHub desktop uh, client, which is a good option if you really want a GUI client. Uh, you can download it um, like, uh, behind this link. And then many uh, IDEs have also version control features integrated, for example, with WebStorm. And so here's now like, a short uh, introduction on uh, like one workflow that you can use uh, to update your homeworks and to automatically uh, like save your homeworks on GitHub. So here, like, we, as you know, the homeworks are published at this, in this repository here. Um, and so you see there's homework zero and homework one. Um, and what we do is we, we initially, we simply clone this. So now I have all these files. Oops. So now I'm in this repository, I have the homework zero and homework one. And now uh, what we can do is, um, well, I did something wrong here. So I need to set a special origin here. So minus origin homework here. If I run this, um, I'm not setting like the default origin. Um, this is now like this is a special own, uh, origin that's called homework. Um, and what we can do by that is we can now push this repository to, repository to your own uh, com, to, or you, to your own GitHub account. So let's say I'm creating a new repository. Okay, now I've created an empty new repository. Um, and I can now add that as a remote or as a remote origin. So that's git remote in the repository of course. Git remote add origin this URL. And now I'm pushing this to my local repository of the homework. So now, essentially what I've made is, I have now one repository on my GitHub that has two different, that uh, points to two different repositories on GitHub. Uh, one of them is the one we control, where we publish homeworks, where we release may, uh, updates to, maybe if we find a bug in, in, our, uh, in our stubs, um, we will release those. And if that happens, or if we release a new homework, all you have to do now is, um, git pull homework master and that will get all the new changes uh, that we have added to the repository and will automatically merge them into your solution. So that is like a recommended workflow. Of course you can simply download it and manage it in any other way. For the homeworks we won't care. For the projects you of course should use uh, a git based workflow or you have to use a git based workflow. Okay, so that was everything that I wanted to say about uh, Git and GitHub, and now let's move on to HTML. Can I ask you a thing? Sure. Um, if, I create, if I create a repository on my account on GitHub, how do you know where to find it? I don't. You, like, this is, uh, so there's two different things. For the homeworks, 
we are never looking at your GitHub repository. It's just like a recommended way because you're, you will have to use it for your project. For your project later, uh, once you have found a team, uh, you will like, have to fill out a Google form telling us all your team members' names, your email addresses, and then your shared uh, GitHub repository for your project. And that's how we find out where uh, your work is stored. So we, we always submit on Canvas? Uh, for the homeworks, yes, you submit on Canvas. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah? When will project collaborations start? Uh, you can start as soon as you want. Uh, the deadlines are already on the calendar. Um, I would say it's, it, it is, like you can start thinking about it. Uh, you can start finding a team. Really starting to work on the project is probably sensible after, let's say, homework four or five, because by then you will have the necessary skills. Any other questions? Great. So, let's talk about HTML. So HTML means hypertext markup language. Um, nowadays it's more of like, essentially how do we render things on the web? We'll be using the HTML5 standard, which does things like graphics, audio, video, SVG, and so on. So this is really, this has changed a lot. HTML5 is very, very different from HTML4. Uh, another an interesting part of HTML5 is also that it's not uh, XML anymore. So there's X, 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 HTML, um, but it's not uh, the proper HTML5 is not an um, XML dialect anymore. So there are some relaxations in there, which I'll be talking about. So the most important uh, parts of um, HTML are, of course, elements. And these elements, like I have text, um, and before I actually talk about this, like these are these interactive boxes that I mentioned. So I can type something here um, and see it added to the next uh, to the window below immediately. I know that there is somewhere here a bug. So some of you might only see two or three lines, uh, or a part of. Like if these boxes get longer, like here, sometimes on some. Uh, uh, on some browsers, not everything is shown, only the first couple of lines are shown. And so what you need to do here is like simply click somewhere, hit a space once, or change something else, and then that should appear. It's like if, in case you're wondering why what, what, what I'm showing you is not what you're seeing there. Um, anyway, so whenever I make an edit to um, any of those attributes here, or any of those code boxes here, it's immediately reflected on here, which is very similar to what we see in JS Fiddle and so on. Um, we can all, you can always also click at the C output a new page. This doesn't take the, this is actually a broken link, great. Um, anyways, when I fix this, you can always look at just this web page uh, and not at any of the other web pages, uh, which is convenient if you want to uh, debug your code in detail. Uh, we'll talk more about this. Okay, so elements. Uh, elements essentially tell, uh, tell like we can do very many things with elements, we'll talk about them. Here we have a strong element, um, that means that the, ele that the content between those elements has these properties of attack applied, in this case it's simply rendered as strong. You can see that the, the rest here is not rendered as strong. Um, so we can also nest these elements, this is a strong part, and then here we have an underline and strong part, because we have this underline in here. Um, then in addition to just the tag names, the element names, uh, the opening tags can contain extra information about the elements which are called attributes. So the, the common one that you probably have seen many times is this href uh, attribute and now here uh, this is like a link address and then this is rendered as a link to Google's main page uh, in this case. So this is pretty simple. Um, href is HTML reference. Um, the types of attributes we'll be using here mainly are things like IDs, classes, style, and styles. These are the ones that we dynamically want to, like IDs and classes, we'll talk more about them when we talk about CSS, but they essentially help us to identify elements on a website, and we want to programmatically um, like label uh, elements on a website and then programmatically retrieve them at a later point. Uh, the difference between the ID and the class uh, is that the ID is supposed to be unique. Uh, so if you actually have more than one ID element, this is not legal, um, and the class is something that you can reuse. So you have like multiple different classes um, of a certain element. Um, you can use self-closing elements. For example, here, um, like this looks like that. This is what 
Um, people that wrote HTML4 code used to do a lot, so there are certain tags, like the break tag that doesn't have an, a closing equivalent. And so what you needed to do is you would need to write uh, something like br uh, space and then uh, slash and then close the tag. So something like this. Um, this is, however, not no longer necessary in HTML5 since this is no longer an XML-based language. It is perfectly legal just to use a break like this. So there's no requirement to have closing tags in HTML5. Um, here are some important tags. I'm not gonna like this is not particularly important, but let's just revisit them. We have HTML tag, the head. Uh, this is essentially defines what is shown in the browser title here. And then we have the body where we have paragraphs. Um, paragraphs of text, we can break lines with the, uh, with the break symbol or with a non-closing break tag, either is fine. Uh, we can include images. Uh, if you use images, you should always provide an alternative text. This is mainly an accessibility uh, feature so that people who with, that use screen readers can understand what the image represents. Um, then we have header, uh, headers with h1 to h6. Uh, we can have lists, we can have ordered lists or unordered lists, and these are the list elements. Also note that you don't actually have to use closing tags anymore in HTML5, so this is perfectly legal here uh, to simply say list and have, don't not have a closing tag. I still, I, I personally, it looks wrong, uh, but it is absolutely legal. Um, here's an unordered list, here's a table. Um, and yeah, like table rows, table uh, headers, table uh, data, and so on. I'm sure you've seen this before. Um, what you, an important element, or two important elements that we use very often to structure HTML are divs. Divs are simply like dividers or divisions of a page, uh, which are often used to provide structure to HTML. Um, these are block elements, so they break lines. And if you need something to identify a subset of the code, but don't want to break a line, you can use the span element. So if we look at this down here, um, so here this is in a div, um, uh, and this one is in a div, and that's why the, here there's a line break. But here we have a couple of spans, that, uh, but they don't break a line. This is like depending on what the desired behavior is, you should use either the one or the other. Uh, and then there are things like forms, um, which we might be using and we might be listening to events and so on. Um, you can of course do comments in HTML with this syntax here um, and then you need to close this and um, close, the, close the body and close the HTML. And so what we can do now is we can look at whether this is actually legal uh, HTML code. So we can either like put a URL in here or I can just paste the code. This is the uh, World Web Web Consortium uh, HTML checker, and you can see that this is a legal document. Uh, there is only one warning, warning that I shouldn't use the border attribute for the table, which is a styling thing. Uh, it's still legal, but it's, it's, it's essentially not encouraged. I've still done it here because we want to see the table down here. Uh, but that's obviously something that you would rather do with CSS. Okay, a couple of other tags that we'll need. We've talked about HTML head tag. We will use the script tag to include JavaScript. Uh, we will use the style tag to include CSS. Uh, we'll use the link tag to um, reference external documents. Um, so here we have uh, the relationship attribute, we have the type attribute, and we have the actual link attribute that we need to specify. And then we've already used the body tag here. And so this is essentially like a, a minimal um, boilerplate that we have to have to have a proper HTML document. And I'm mostly using proper HTML documents from now on. So you should be able to copy and paste them in any way. Okay, so um, this is the introduction to HTML. Uh, one thing that I wanted to emphasize is that the relationship between the document object model and HTML. Who, who can explain the difference? So the document object model is essentially what is rendered in the browser. It's like the tree that of the HTML code that we can look at in the browser. So we can, for example, inspect the source code of any website. And what we see here, like in this, uh, in this Google developer tools, is the DOM. 
In this case, uh, the DOM, like we're not using any JavaScript on this website. Um, so in this case, the DOM corresponds pretty much exactly to the HTML that, it, that builds that website. But the DOM is also an API. So the DOM has certain functions that I can access via JavaScript where I can dynamically modify the DOM. And that is what we'll be doing a lot in this class. So if you've used things like jQuery or simply the standard API or D3 before, these are all methods to that programmatically generate the DOM from code. So you can start with an HTML document and take JavaScript, modify that HTML document essentially virtually and when you do that, it's called the DOM, essentially. Okay. Great. So next we'll talk about... Any questions about this? Okay. Next we'll talk about CSS. Um, and again, we'll not be talking about how to style things, but what I really care about uh, is selectors. Um, so the, there's a couple of different selectors, like here is how you would use um, CSS. This is like in the style tags. Um, and so we are now here using an element selector for strong. Um, and this is like some styling information. I'm setting background color red, font size to 300%. Um, and then down here, I, am, I have this HTML, and this is the part that is in the strong tags. And therefore, this element selector here matches to the strong element. So if I added another, another strong here, we would see that this matches equally because um, it matches this tag. Uh, and that's pretty simple. Um, yeah, so everything inside the curly brackets here is the declaration and we always have the syntax of like what do we want to change and what is the value of it and then like the semicolon to terminate a line. Um, okay, um, we can also do things like that. Uh, we can separate it out um, and if they are not conflicting, both of them apply. If those are conflicting, the most recent one applies. Um, so we can, we can spread that out in some way. Um, then a very important one is the class selector. I already mentioned this about the class attributes and the class selectors are identified by a leading dot. So for example, something like dot menu. So here is an example. I have three divs with uh, classes. This one is important, this one is footnote. This one has two classes, important footnote. Um, and then I'm styling important to have a uh, bold font weight and then footnote to have a 75% uh, font size. So that's what I'm doing to this. Um, and as you can see, like this one here has a bold weight. Uh, this one here is uh, only 75% of the side and this uh, size. And this one here at the bottom is both an important and a footnote and therefore it's bold and only 75% of the size. So that's pretty simple and I can reuse these classes as often as I want, of course. Uh, in contrast to that, we have CSS ID selectors, which are um, identified by a leading hashtag. So hashtag header, for example, or hashtag ID name. Um, so let's say we have here something like first line, second line, and important. And important is not a good ID, right? This is a much better class, but here, for the purpose of this example, that's fine. Um, I'm specifying those with the ID attribute ID first line, ID second line, ID important. Um, and then uh, we can see uh, that these are actually applied uh, based on these IDs. So we have font white bold, color blue, that's the first one. Then we have uh, a little bit increased font size for the second line, and then some beautiful red text shadow, text shadow um, for the third one. So what would happen if I do this? You see what happens. <laughs> is this a good idea? No. 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 That's fine to do with classes, but this is not valid HTML5 because IDs are supposed to be used only once per page. And so IDs are kind of like global variables. Um, so you should be using them sparingly, uh, but they, they of course um, have their place. Um, anything else you wanted to say? No, I think that's basically um, it. Um, you can use, um, for example, IDs and CSS to create the layout of a page. So what we want to do is we have like a, a menu div, then here we have a main content div, and then here we have a footer div. 
Um, we don't like traditional or in HTML4 and before this was usually done with tables and that's of course discouraged now because it's going to make your life a living hell if you want to port to mobile. Um, but if you do it like this, you can dynamically control your CSS. Um, and here is like just some simple example, like I have the sidebar ID for this navigation element, um, then I have the main ID for the main content element, and then I have the footer ID for the footer element, uh, and then I can place them uh, by using CSS here, and by using ID selectors. Um, another thing that you might not have come across too often is relationship selectors. So, like I've done, I've, we've selected based on elements, based on IDs, and based on classes, but we can also uh, have more complex rules on what matches a selection. Um, that is essentially something that can be interesting if you work with uh, D3. So, for example, here is a child selector. That means this matches every bold element that is directly a child of uh, a paragraph element. Um, and here we have uh, a descendant selector. This matches every bold element that is somewhat like a descendant at some level of a diff element. So this is a direct child. This could be grandfather, grandson uh, relationship that would be fine. So how does this look like in practice? So here we have we have this direct child B of P um, here is the text, that this is bold within the paragraph, but then I'm adding a span here, and then with something bold here has a highlight, but it's not going to show up in blue because it is not a direct descendant. Uh, it's not a direct child, but a, a multi-level descendant. Uh, in contrast to that, down here I have the same thing, a div and then a span and then a bold text, but I'm applying this div B is a descendant selector, so this is going to be rendered in green. Um, okay, and so um, the other thing that um, if you have multiple conflicting rules in CSS, it can be pretty tricky. Um, the rule, like specifically in the standard, is that the most specific uh, CSS will be applied, but it's really hard to tell. So the best approach to resolve those problems is to do some way of debugging. Um, and then we can also um, there's a couple of other ways of declaring CSS. Um, what we commonly do is we use a separate style sheet. Um, so we in simply include a reference to a separate style sheet and then have all of our CSS in the separate file. Um, and uh, we can also directly embed style tags in any of those elements. This is generally, like especially if you write raw HTML, it's rather discouraged. But in practice, if you compute computationally by using JavaScript, uh, create something like that, you kind of like abstract it away at a higher level, so for automatically generated DOM elements that is not an, not a, like say, not completely unacceptable. Okay, so the last part that I wanted to talk about code today is um, scalable vector graphics. Um, and so scalable vector graphics, we've only looked at textual content in HTML, uh, but what we now want to do is we want to look at how we can we create visualizations and we can use the SVG uh, standard to do that. So SVG is a subset of the HTML5 standard that will essentially allow us to draw, draw everything that we need. Um, it's a very powerful, Illustrator can export to it, you can include SVG elements and images in modern browsers um, and so on. And it's also the preferred target for D3. However, this is like strictly speaking not necessary. D3 is just like a DOM manipulation language, and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, but in practice, we'll be mostly using SVG. Um, so here is our very first SVG um, element. So what this does is it simply uh, creates an SVG. We have to define the width and the height of the SVG. So it is essentially a rectangle. Um, but of course, this is empty. Um, and we don't see anything, and this link is all done broken, but let's just take a look. No, this works. So we can inspect, um, and we see that there's indeed an SVG element in here, uh, but I get an empty one. Okay, so now we'll add a circle. Uh, we'll add a circle by simply um, using the circle command. We define uh, the center uh, X position, the center Y position, and the radius, and then I'm here also defining a style. And please note that the CSS style 
that is used for um, SVG is not the same. It sometimes overlaps, but sometimes it does not uh, as the styling, the CSS styling that you would use for uh, HTML elements. So there, these are different. Uh, for example, there is no fill uh, element in CSS for, um, for just like regular uh, HTML. Um, okay, and so what I do by this, uh, what I get here is a circle at position 200, um, 100 of radius 50. Um, we can look at um, the coordinate system here. We have a coordinate system that starts at the top left. So if we go to 0, 0, we'll see that we only see a quarter of the circle. A coordinate system starts up here, and we have to position according to that. Uh, ellipsis, um, just as easy, we have um, uh, a, a position, a, a center position in X, a center position in Y, an RX and an RY, so how high, how wide, um, and then again styling it, um, very simple, it's basically the same thing. Um, then uh, we have rectangles, for rectangles we define an X and the Y position, a width and the height, and again we style it in some way, um, and again uh, we see our rectangle here, like if we make it a little bit narrower, uh, we can see that we have essentially a bar chart, and then we can add, add multiple of those to create a bar chart. Uh, we can create lines, um, either individually or with the path element. I'll talk about the path element later. Um, and then your homework will ask you to use both. Um, so here we have um, a line. Uh, we simply give it a class here just to illustrate that I can also use this uh, CSS class-based styling. Um, and then I have an X1, a Y1, X2, Y2 position. The same for the second line, and you can see this is like a line from 3030 to 280. And if you go to, let's say, 150 or 50 and 80, this is how the line changes. And again, all of this is in the coordinate system that starts at the upper left corner. Uh, we can also add text. Um, the text can also be positioned, or is also positioned with X and Y. Uh, uh, we simply, like, here, we could do something like this. Of course, it could be done in HTML too, but that would be, uh, well, not very intuitive. Um, so text elements, X and Y position where the text starts. Um, the path element is a little bit more interesting because, like, up to this point, we've only used basic shapes in SVG, but with the path element we can create arbitrary complex shapes. Um, and so the path element has like a mini language, and this is the mini language here. Um, and so the most important element here are um, M, L, Z, and uh, Z, and, and C. Um, M essentially moves, like think of it as, if you're, if you're trying to draw on, on the blackboard, by M I move my pen without putting it down on paper. Um, so essentially here I'm moving to position 10, 10. And then by the L uh, command draws a line from the previous position to the position specified. So if I look at this here, I have M, 10, 10, so moving it to position 10, 10. And then from 10, 10 I draw a line to 50, 10. So this is this segment here. From 10, 10 to 50, 10. If I, for example, change this to 0, 0. Um, this starts here at the very top. I have to have the M though, like it doesn't work without the M. So it doesn't make any assumptions of an initial position. Um, um, so from there on out, I can essentially keep drawing in, this, in these positions, like 250, 50 to 150 and so on. These are all absolute coordinates, um, so that's easy to do. So like simple lines are easy to do. Um, here then I'm using a uh, well, so before I do the more complicated thing is I could also add a, a Z in here. And the Z would essentially tell uh, the SEG element to close the path. And now I could use a fill and then I could have like a fill polygon, for example, of an arbitrary shape. Uh, if I don't close it, we simply have this line segment here. Okay, and now let's talk a little bit about this um, C, which allows us to draw curves. Um, and so what this C command does, it um, draws cubic splines. And cubic splines need um, a couple of, like need um, a slope, um, a, a, a slope, then a support point, um, and a terminal point. 
And so the first thing here we specify is the slope. The second thing we specify here is the support point, which I'm highlighting here in red. And the third point here is um, the terminal bond point. So we have this C, X1, X, uh, Y1, uh, X2, Y2, and then X and Y, uh, for example, as our terminal points. And so if I were to change that slope in some way, let's say I, wanna, I want this to be steeper down here, you can see that this now points uh, further down uh, and <coughs> going through the support point. I can make this more radical and so on. So I can modify that spline here dynamically. Um, so in practice, this is not something that we will do by hand much. Uh, there are these line generator functions that D3 has. Um, so we'll put in a data array, uh, some transfer function, and then get out um, a path, or essentially the, the, this, the code here for that, and then use that for the path element. Um, uh, but it's still good to know, and there's a lot of other things that you can do in this uh, by looking into this Mozilla um, path tutorial here. So this is like everything that I'm showing here and much more is explained um, here how the effect of these different um, parameters, how they play out and there's other types of splines um, and so on. Um, generally, um, if you look up anything while you're doing SVG, JavaScript or whatever, I would always recommend to use the MDN web docs instead of anything else. Uh, because they're kind of the standard. Um, you shouldn't use this, uh, this um, W3C, um, like the, the thing that comes up by default on your, uh, on your Google search is usually not the best. I would every time you submit a query for some kind of uh, HTML, CSS, or JavaScript uh, question, I would always add MDN because then you get uh, the right resources and I'm also adding like a lot of links um, into, uh, into here. Okay, so uh, next we of course have to worry if we draw, uh, we have to worry about ordering. So here we have two, diff like two elements that have two different orderings and the different orderings uh, is of course very important for how they are represented uh, on the screen. So we can see that we have here a rectangle and the ellipse. The first one, the rectangle is rendered on top, the ellipse in back, that corresponds to the ellipse being um, like in, like here the code of the ellipse coming first in the DOM, and the code of the rectangle coming uh, second in the DOM, and now this is flipped. Here we have the ellipse on top. Uh, so the rendering order corresponds to the order in the DOM, and therefore if you have like a hidden element or something like that, you would need to check your rendering order or your uh, order of the element in the DOM. Another important concept is grouping. Um, so up to now, we've always positioned everything uh, by hand. Um, so uh, like here, for example, we're positioning all of these points by absolute coordinates, 50, 50, 80, 100, and so on. But that is not necessarily super convenient. Um, and so the example, like what you want to do very often is, let's say, for example, you have a bar chart uh, and you want uh, to label the bar chart. You want to like, put the value of the bar chart next to it. So you use, um, uh, like you position your bar chart, your horizontal bar chart um, in Y somewhat, and then you would have to calculate the position of the label and then apply the Y again to that label. What you could do instead is you could create like a bar group and add a rectangle and a text to it and then position them in Y once and then only worry about the position in X. So we have kind of like a nesting uh, for SVG elements. Um, in this case, I'm using the nesting because like if we do something like a scatter plot, our intuition is not uh, a coordinate system in the upper left corner, right? We always think of a scatter plot to be in the lower left, like to originate in the lower left corner somewhere here. Um, and so writing down those values um, is very unintuitive for us. If you want to say like this is 50, 50, well, we would have to like uh, subtract that from the height or from the distance to our axis and so on. So that's not very convenient. And what we instead could do is we could wrap this in a group element, then do a transformation uh, and, a and flip it around once uh, to the, so that we have essentially we can 
right in the coordinate system that we like, that we kind of understand intuitively. So here, at this point here, let's say, let's start at 0, 0. This is 0, 0 here. And then next to that, we would have 10. 10. So this is exactly what we would expect. Maybe it looks better if we do 20, 20. Um, and so what am I doing here? Uh, there's two things going on here. There's the group element um, that essentially packs all of those together. And then I'm using this transformation attribute. And this transformation, again, is a little bit of a mini syntax. Um, so we have things like translate, scale, rotate, uh, also skew, and so on. So any kind of matrix space transformation that you can think of, you can do with this transformation element. Um, in practice, we will mainly use translate. Uh, but here I'm also translating it and then flipping it over so that we can use this coordinate system. Anybody can see a potential problem with that? Uh, a rooting shape? Yeah, if we have certain shapes, it can be a problematic. Oh, well, what if your point goes beyond 200? Well, then I have to figure something out anyways, right? Uh, so this is based on, this translation here is based on the height of the, uh, of the element. So I have to kind of synchronize this. And I would, like, if I write this in JavaScript, I would have a variable uh, or something like that. Um, well, one other problem is that we, this also applies to text. And this is how they read text in Australia. Um, uh, not really. Of course, this is like a little bit inconvenient. And so in practice, um, not, it's not the, best, uh, not, not the best solution, but it clearly shows uh, what we can do with this translate attribute. OK. Um, so for this is kind of like what I wanted to cover in terms of uh, content today. Um, and now. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them now, but otherwise, we would, I would go back to our exercise. Yep? I have a question about the, um, the transformation. Of the sure. Group. Does the order of your translation and your scale and those transformations matter? Yes, it parses from right to left. Okay. Um, there is, um, yes, it does matter. Um, of course, it depends on what you're doing to it, but uh, um, it, it, the, the, it parses from <coughs> right to left. And there is, Somewhere here, a link to the details. Yeah. So you can look up the details of everything that is possible um, on the MDN here. Um, you can do like rotations and so on. Any other questions? So this should essentially give you all the skills you need for the first homework. As I said, this is very, very simple. It shouldn't take you more than half an hour if you've ever used HTML before. If you still need any help, there will be a uh, uh, tutorial tomorrow uh, at 6 p.m. in L110 or 101, one of the 110. 110. So across the hall from here, uh, or Carolina will introduce this. And then there is linked from here is an exercise um, that we will essentially do tomorrow in this tutorial. Um, it, this is, of course, completely voluntarily. If you feel like you can complete this homework by yourself, there's no need for you to come unless you want to hear what, Car what else Carolina has to say, of course. Um, but this format will be, I think, more interesting once we start getting into a little bit more nitty-gritty uh, JavaScript things. Okay. Any other questions about oh, HTML? Could we use the CSS on SVG elements? You can use um, styling on SVG elements, but it is different syntax. So, like you would have things like background color in HTML, but you would have fill uh, in uh, in uh, in SVG. So this is a little bit annoying, but in, in, it's not hard to do in practice. Yeah. So for homework one, you want us to include the styling, the CSS styling inside the HTML file? Um, I think it, the homework instructions are specific, so I just want to would, would recommend that you follow what are in the instructions. I don't know exactly, I don't remember at this point what, what they put in there. So what is the solution to the part where the text also inverts when you translate it? Not use the, uh, the <laughs> So like the problem is not the translation, it's the scaling. It's the scaling. Yeah. yeah. Um, so not using the scaling is the solution to that problem. Yeah. Or yeah. So you'll have to do a little bit of like math. 
it's not it's still a little hard, but any other questions? Okay, so then let's take a look at uh, where we left off with the design critique. Um, who remembered to bring their sketches? Like their your redesigns? So do you, like let's let's take five minutes and then work a little bit more on your redesigns. Like have three different versions uh, a redesign of this chart. I'll come around and then we'll discuss a professional redesign. I brought paper again if somebody needs any. Thank you. 
couple of nice designs here. Uh, do you want to? Do you want to explain that? Yeah. Okay. So it's it's not that great, but it's pretty basic. So uh, I thought like the graph that was being shown, the word, the one that we are referring to, has four portions of information that it is presenting. Like what is the percentage? Whether it's like if the disease is in growth or in uh, like it's going down in percentage. One is the actual value, like uh, how many people are dying every year from the disease itself. One is the name of the disease, and the other one is the classification of the disease, like we know there are three. So like it's a basic uh, two-dimensional uh, graph. In the y-axis, I showed the percentage, whether it's going up or down, instead of actually showing the number itself, like 1% or minus 1%. In the x-axis, I showed the absolute count of death. And as you can see that there are circles and like beside them their name of the disease or the cause of death and the classification by um, you know the shading or the color like if it was something colorful. So, uh, so uh, the circle would be bigger and would be more right and up if the percentage if it's growing and if the count of death is high and it would come down if the percentage is decreasing and it would move left if the absolute count of death is like Cool. Okay, cool. So, so. Thank you very much. So, then we have this one here. Do you want to briefly explain it? Or would you rather explain the other one? So, th this looks like a pie chart, but it is size is proportional to the big categories. And then we have the segments uh, in here that represent the relative sizes. Uh, I found this one very interesting. Do you want to say something about it? So how do you visualize the change here? Uh, the change is the 1%, the 1, 2, 3, and minus 1, minus 2, and minus 3. Make sure okay, so essentially what we have here is a two stack bar chart, right? Um, and then you additionally encode the change with this nested bar chart in here, which I think is a pretty cool idea. Thank you. Um, and then one more. Yes. So, how do you encode the absolute values of the life lost? Like, this is great for change, right? Yeah, it's by uh, the thickness. By thickness? Yeah. Ah, okay, got it. Okay, great. So, now I'll be handing out... Um, I have one when I don't use colors as well. Okay. Um, the, it's not going to work that fast. Somebody cannot see the distinction in colors. Yeah, let's see how long it takes six in my computer. <laughs> yeah, I'll hand this out while we're waiting. Um, what you see here is this was a chart that, because Bill Gates endorsed it, it got a lot of like. <coughs> noise on Twitter, uh, and then uh, a guy called Stephen Pugh, who is like a visualization consultant, he is this like, a very old school, uh, very minimalist uh, person who is like business analytics mostly, uh, and so he created a long blog post uh, about why this chart is terrible um, and how it could be done much better. And so this is his solution, could you help me handle this out? Um, and so you guys can take a look. 
be leftovers? Sorry. So let's look at this chart. So how is this chart different from the one we saw before? One of the other end, please speak up. Specific information is separate uh, distinction. I mean, you can easily look at them get the special value at the same time get understanding yes. trend analysis. So we have three columns. We have the years of life loss per hundred thousand, the percent change, and the death per hundred thousand. Um, so these, all of these three variables are very clearly separated. What's the advantage of that? Like we can. From this, this I can't, I can't figure out which should the get a story. Uh, you can't figure out which. Which, which kind of. That is true. So you don't. What you lose here is the total, like a visualization of the totals. No, that's at the top left. But exactly, there is an additional little chart here uh, where he simply puts a table up there. But yes, that is a that is a valid criticism. It's not immediately obvious. You have to read this more closely. So what other thing did he do here that did wasn't in, done in the other chart? So, yep. you get the exact percentages, percent changes. Exactly, you can read the percent changes very clearly. So you can see that other communicable diseases, meningitis and hepatitis, uh, decreased um, more than 30% in the last five years. So that is essentially, like all of these gray ones here is what Bill Gates was talking about, that there's progress being made in this communicable diseases that, uh, being addressed in developing countries. Uh, where do we have um, an increase? Uh, this is injuries other than accidents and self-harm. So there is like an increase in changes of your life lost, and then we have an increase in neurological disorders, stroke, uh, and diabetes, and like blood disorders. Um, another thing that wasn't in the original chart is this distinction between uh, death per 100,000 uh, and years of life lost. And the point here is mainly that there is a difference between, like, everybody dies eventually for some reason. Uh, but there's a difference if I die at 105 of, like, a heart failure, or if I die of uh, malaria at 25, right? Uh, there is a different impact on society. And so instead of, like, um, having absolute number of deaths, what, what he does in this chart is he adds this derived value of years of life lost per 100,000. And so we can see here, for example, that the most common cause of death is actually heart disease, uh, but, it is, um, but it is not as important in the years of life lost. Whereas neonatal and maternal disorders, uh, they are very small in absolute numbers, but in terms of years of life lost, because it mainly affects babies, uh, they're quite significant, and so it depends on the question that you want to ask. Uh, what is the more important thing? But in practice, you mostly care about the years of life loss from a public health perspective. So, compared to the other chart, which one do you prefer? And because but what do you think if you saw a chart like this in, like, say, the New York Times? compared to the other one, or in a magazine at a coffee table. <laughs> yeah, it's simpler, it's boring, it doesn't draw your attention as much. Okay, great, so let's conclude the class for today. Sorry. I have a question about this, because this particular graph, we don't have information in the middle of the panel, setting it between the best and the other side, what do you get the information? You calculate. Like he probably used another data source. Yeah, but there's a link to his blog post and I'm sure it's going to like in the second sheet. Okay, well do next Thursday we'll have a theory lecture and then on Tuesday we'll have a code lecture again. I'll see you then.